welcome all to Built Worlds uh, and those of us uh, tuning in on the live stream, we're happy to have you. This is our debut for this new uh, technology. Uh, for those of you who are new to us, we are a digital media company that, focus, that fosters a better understanding of technology and innovation as it relates to the built environment. Uh, on that note, I can't think of a better uh, topic than the one we're featuring this evening. Uh, as many of you know, additive manufacturing or 3D printing uh, is really changing every industry that uh, it is touching, whether it's uh, you know, from toy manufacturing to biomedical to uh, aerospace uh, and uh, you know, the, the new space industry. Uh, so I'm sure all of you are wondering how it is going to apply to your industries, whether that's architecture, construction, design, engineering, uh, as we are here. So we're very excited to have a, a really stacked show this evening. The first part will feature our, uh, B, our Built Worlds NU team, which is a uh, joint research initiative between Built Worlds and uh, mechanical engineering students from Northwestern University in our effort to always reach out to the next, next generation and show them all the cool jobs that are available in the construction industry. We actively seek uh, partnerships with them uh, and helped this particular team uh, put together a senior capstone project where they explore the practical realities of 3D printing in the AEC. Following that, we have uh, three uh, leaders who are really at the forefront of bringing this technology to its fruition. Uh, joining us this evening for uh, individual presentations followed by a panel discussion uh, and that includes Dr. Barack Koshnevis from Contour Crafting, James Wolf of D-Shape Enterprises, and Maged Gurgis from SOM. Um, I'll give them a bit more uh, of a better introduction following the uh, Northwestern students presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our uh, Built Worlds NU team to the stage. Please uh, welcome them. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, as Dimitri introduced, we are Built Worlds North, uh, NU, a collaboration between Built Worlds and Northwestern University. Um, uh, our project was able to succeed with help from Built Worlds and Northwestern, as well as support from Master Gra Graphics, SOM, XTech, uh, the 3D Printer Experience, and Apis Core. Um, so I'm Connie Gu, and I want to quickly introduce the rest of my team members. This is Patrick Peng, Brendan O'Connell, Annie Kopp, Jason Vignolo, and Tim Stead. Uh, so when Built Worlds approached us, they really wanted us to develop a solution that would bridge the gap between the construction industry and emerging technologies such as additive manufacturing. So that's where our project really took off. When we examined sort of what was going on in the industry, um, we came across a study by jbknowledge.com. Uh, they survey various construction companies, and in the survey of over 2,000 companies, 70% uh, said that they were not experimenting with any emerging technologies, and only 5% said that they were experimenting with 3D printers. So this clearly illustrates the gap um, where there's an opportunity uh, for learning and teaching in these two industries. So from here, after talking with Built Worlds, uh, meeting with our team, um, we wanted to create a solution that would help uh, convey a basic understanding of how concrete-based additive manufacturing worked. This is primarily for those in the construction industry with no background on additive manufacturing. Uh, then we wanted to show how specifically concrete-based concrete additive manufacturing differed from traditional uh, construction methods, as well as the various nuances associated with it. And finally, how concrete-based additive manufacturing may be integrated and used in uh, the construction workflow. So on the, mac on the micro scale um, for creating small objects, there are a plethora of different uh, techniques, including st uh, stereolithography, fused deposition modeling, selective laser sintering, and binder jetting. But what we wanted to do is really isolate uh, these techniques used on the macro micro scale and see how they could be leveraged on the macro scale. So uh, Patrick will talk a little bit about some of the solutions that we explored. Thanks, Connie. All right, so binder jetting, uh, on the desktop scale, basically what happens before most 3D printing operations is um, a computer will take a 3D model of your part and slice it into thin cross sections horizontally. So what happens here is you have a bed of powder and then the printer head um, deposits a binding agent which solidifies the powder that is being printed on in the shape of that cross section. And then a new layer of powder is swept over it, and then the next cross section is printed. This way, um, the shape, as, as seen here, um, is printed. And just to, when it's done, you just need to get rid of 
all the powder encasing it, and then you can retrieve your finished part. Um, this here is a 3D printer developed by D-Shape. You can see it on your left here. Uh, it's printing a cross section there, and the finished part can be seen on the right. Um, it's capable of printing very complex geometries, and the, the loose powder acts as a sort of support uh, material that allows you to print overhangs. However, it does require you to remove all of the powder around it before you can actually get the part. Um, th th another method that we think is um, suitable for being scaled up to the construction um, industry is fused depth engine modeling, also known as FDM. On the desktop scale, you might have seen uh, MakerBot. That this is the technology that they use. Basically, you have a um, you have a nozzle that's extruding melted plastic filament onto a build surface in the shape of those aforementioned slices, and they just layer on top of each other to build the final part. This requires you to sort of have support structures to allow you to build overhangs, so that's sort of a limitation there. So here you can see that um, FDM being applied to concrete on the left here. You can see it's extruding a pretty complex shape without the use of formwork, which is uh, really intriguing. Additionally, on the right here, you can see uh, contour crafting technology developed by uh, Dr. Koshnevis out of USC. It uses computer-controlled trowels to sort of allow you to create complex surfaces and sort of smooth out the edges of your extrusion. And here you can see uh, an image of a 3D printer developed by Apis Core, which is based in Russia. The, what, they were, what they've been able to do is mount a concrete extruder on a robotic arm. And they've been able to print a one-story building in one day using this method. You can see on the right here the uh, extruded layers. You can see sort of how you, sort of the layer, layers themselves are visible there. Now, Brendan will talk about mechanical properties. All right, so in our research of current solutions in this field, we were able to identify four of the main challenges facing concrete-based additive manufacturing. And these are the material properties of the printed structures uh, on versus off-site fabrication and what that means, uh, the installation of subsystems, and the necessity for support structures in printing. So first of all, with material properties, uh, because this is a layer-based method, this means that uh, the structures have different strength based on the direction you're going. This, this is uh, shown in the image on the left. Uh, it has different strength in the direction that the layers are printed and in the direction that the layers are stacked. And then also, even minor flaws in the extrusion uh, from layer to layer can cause uh, stress in different areas, which uh, will not be accounted for and will cause uh, the building to not have as much strength. And then uh, perhaps the most important mechanical property comes from the balance between uh, the, the time when the next layer is printed. You have to balance uh, the previous layer being rigid enough to support it while also still being able to have enough strength to bond with the next layer. Uh, so as you can see in the graph on the right, as the time gap increases between when layers are printed, the bond strength decreases. So you have to find the balance between uh, a rigid enough uh, bottom layer and enough of a bond strength. And so next with onverse offsite fabrication, so some companies have used this method uh, with a non-portable 3D printer to produce uh, structures in, say, a warehouse, uh, and then take these to the site and assemble them there, which requires more transportation and more assembly on site. And uh, other companies, however, have developed mobile 3D printers, so they can take this to the job site and actually build there. But this doesn't allow for the uh, uh, st structures that are as large uh, as those printed off site and then assembled on site. And then with subsystems, uh, certain subsystems, such as electrical systems and plumbing systems, they can't be printed using the same printing methods because they require different materials and complex architectures. So this requires them to be manually installed after the fact, and these need to be accounted for during the initial printing of the structure. And finally, with support structures, uh, so as you can see in the image on top, if, if the layers are printed at an angle like that, they're able to support each other. But uh, as shown with the middle image, if you're trying to print uh, a structure like a window or a door where there's a large gap like that, this won't work because when the layer is printed across the gap, it's not rigid enough to support itself and, and it won't be able to create that structure. So there is a necessity for support structures or other methods to allow this shape to be printed. Now Annie's going to talk about some of the benefits of additive manufacturing. Now for the good news. Um, 
through our research and conversations with experts in the field, we compiled a list of benefits um, which relate to cost, speed, waste materials, the ability to print complex shapes, uh, rep repeatability, and flexibility. So first of all, um, although the initial cost of implementing additive manufacturing in construction is, is relatively high, um, we, we found that there are significant advantages when it comes to productivity. Um, and through, through some research, we found that in building a concrete wall, um, it's estimated that it's, you could have a 27% higher um, productivity when using additive manufacturing as opposed to traditional methods. Um, cost savings can also come um, with reduced labor, labor costs and the reduced likelihood of accidents. As mentioned earlier by Patrick, um, APIS Core was able to print a one-story building in one day, so um, there are notable speed um, increases in speed, which, which are important for construction. Um, additionally, so waste, waste materials are a big problem for construction, and an additive manufacturing has the ability to possibly minimize those. So this can be done through removing the need for concrete mold materials. Um, the elimination or reduction of the rework process because, because it can be designed beforehand and you have a little bit more of an idea of, of what's going to be required and the reduction in access material as mentioned before. So um, with, as you can see in the images below with D-shapes object to the, to the left and Brock Koshinevis's to the right, um, there are, the, the designer has a lot more freedom to, to print complex shapes using additive manufacturing, um, and this can be done by increasing the support structure, and, and there's just a lot more freedom with the design process. And lastly, the repeatability and flexibility is, is notable with additive manufacturing, um, because uh, the design process is over a computer network. Um, changes to plans can be can be updated across all the networks, so there's no miscommunication, really, and um, it eliminates the, the human error associated with the process. And now Jason's going to take over. Thank you. So as a part of our um, capstone design engineering course, and also to help us sort of uh, achieve our mission statement, we wanted to create a uh, demonstration device, a concrete-based additive manufacturing machine. Um, so over the last 10 weeks, we've been able to prototype um, one of the major systems of that. Uh, so what we have here is a picture of what that full system might look like. Uh, as I said, we've only worked on um, prototyping one of the major subsystems, and that's the uh, concrete delivery system. Um, and that's the system that focus on delivering, focuses on delivering the concrete to the extrusion nozzle. Uh, the nozzle itself is another one of the main subsystems of a sort of full demonstration device. And then also the position control, which is sort of the system that controls um, how do we interpret the sort of like CAD information and move our nozzle to the correct location to sort of print uh, onto the print surface the material? So, um, so as we started to sort of begin designing our concrete delivery subsystem, uh, we had two sort of uh, competing ideas or concepts uh, for how we sort of sort of wanted to drive our concrete and sort of like force it. We need to power and force it out through our uh, to like tubing and hosing and into the extrusion nozzle. So we have the uh, bag concept and the plunger concept. Uh, so both of them involve a pressure vessel, and in the bag concept, the idea is, is that we pressurize the pressure vessel, and then the concrete is inside the bag, and then almost like you're squeezing a tube of toothpaste, uh, the bag will compress, and that will force concrete out, uh, and then it will move through the tubing and eventually get to the nozzle and be extruded onto the print surface. Uh, the other is the plunger concept, which you can see, and in, this is similar in that we pressurize the pressure vessel, but instead of sort of squeezing a bag, we have a plunger, and the air pressure is putting a force on the plunger, which then forces the concrete as it moves through the pressure vessel and pushes the concrete out, um, out through the tubing to the extrusion nozzle. Uh, so after some sort of initial testing, some really early prototyping, we found the plunger concept to have a little bit more success. So that's what we moved forward with. Uh, so what we have here are um, sort of some major iterations we had in our plunger design. Uh, the one on the left was our first iteration. Um, on the top, you can see we just have a pneumatic circuit. That's just our airline. Um, that's what's like providing the power. We have our pressure vessel, and we have uh, our plunger, which was a rubber gasket. Uh, and after testing in this case, we found that um, there were some inconsistencies in our flow. Um, things were like coming out as smoothly and consistently as we wanted to. We thought that might have been from air impurities that were sort of getting into our flow. Maybe they were getting around the side of our rubber, rubber gasket. Uh, and so 
we moved into our second iteration where we attempted to sort of solve this with a more advanced plunger, uh, which you can see here we have some O-rings that make our plunger have a better seal with the inside of the pressure vessel as it's moving along through it. Uh, that means that air has a harder time getting into mixed third concrete and creating impurities. And additionally, we added a sort of more complex pneumatic line so we had more control and we could control the sort of on and off capabilities of our extrusion uh, with a little more fine tuning. Uh, so what we have here are just some pictures of what this looks like. Uh, so on the top left, we actually have our, uh, that's our plunger there. It's a polyethylene rod. Uh, machine down to the proper dimensions. We actually uh, put in some grooves so that the O-rings could sit in right. Uh, then on the bottom, you can see the pressure vessel itself. Um, that's just some um, Schedule 40 PVC pipe there that has the proper like strength requirements to sort of safely contain uh, pressurized concrete and air. Uh, and then we also just have a picture there of some um, extruded concrete using this sort of system. And now I'm going to hand things over to Tim. Great, thanks, Jason. So, uh, as Jason sort of introduced, this uh, you know part of our project was a really interesting engineering exercise, and it required that we make some uh, engineering decisions along the way with regards to how we wanted to achieve the goal of uh, you know constant flow of, uh, of material, and also to show off sort of um, you know the internals of what's going on, um, and so. Um, on this slide, we uh, show two of the um, different um, methods that we were looking at for um, basically providing that um, actuation uh, impetus, I guess, for delivering the material to the nozzle um, from our delivery system. And so um, the top uh, shows a potential system set up with um, a pneumatic actuator and um, sort of uh, the pneumatic circuit that would be used um, to control that. And uh, so we actually ended up testing a little bit with that and um, also sort of integrating with some of the research that we did with um, the properties, the flowing properties of fresh uh, concrete, um, we determined that the pneumatic systems um, sort of, uh, you know, inherent kind of um, acting as um, an effort source um, to drive the material really allowed um, the flow to be um, dependent really only on the resistance of the line um, from which the concrete was flowing. And so um, moving away from that towards the um, electromechanical system, which is actually what we had here, um, that provided an interesting um, sort of uh, alternative to um, the uh, effort source system um, of the, or rather the you know, effort source property of the pneumatic system. And so this is almost more similar to um, as a, um, you know, a screw that's driving a uh, syringe of concrete almost. Um, this was uh, lending itself much more closely to um, something that would inherently give us a more constant flow rate. And so um, it was decisions like that that were really, um, you know, pretty interesting in approaching, um, you know, as a part of um, this engineering project. And so um, as you can see on the right, there's a picture of our mock-up with uh, the pneumatic actuator in place. Um, and then additionally, here's a photo of um, what's actually in front of us today, which is the electromechanical system. Um, and so uh, on this slide, we have a quick video of what we were able to um, extrude with um, the electromechanical system, showing um, manually moving the nozzle um, in, order to, uh, in order to get um, some constant extrusion, uh, or rather a path of extrusion of the, uh, of the material. And so uh, one of the things that was pretty interesting about this was that um, we were able to um, sort of fill up and uh, um, you know, basically uh, insert the material into the um, vessel, um, you know, control through uh, um, basic PWM scheme, the velocity of the, um, of the actuator, and then um, get the extrusion um, from, the, uh, from, the, from the nozzle. And so, uh, as you can kind of see, this is sped up 1.5 times. Um, we were able to get relatively constant um, flow from the, from the nozzle. And uh, so this is, again, just a quick video of uh, what, we were so, what, what we were sort of able to get um, with regards to our current um, sort of step in the, uh, in the prototype of this, uh, of this delivery system. So as Jason kind of alluded to, this is sort of, um, you know, we're at the halfway point with regards to, uh, you know, where we are going to eventually go with um, this delivery system in uh, context of the entire, um, you know, full, uh, I guess, uh, concrete additive manufacturing machine that sort of acts as, addition, as an additional like demonstration device. Um, 
And so one of the other things that we were hoping to just kind of have a little fun with, I guess, uh, we were looking at um, actually some concepts for um, the uh, solving the issue of actually being able to extrude over a small linear gap um, with the extrusion of concrete. And so uh, we have a couple mock-ups that we were looking at um, that really just uh, we're hoping to investigate in the coming 10 weeks of this project um, to see, you know, what kind of um, solutions there are to um, being able to uh, extrude over a small linear gap with, um, with concrete extrusion. And uh, so, again, in the, in the coming 10 weeks, we really are looking at um, really having fun with, uh, you know, with, the, with the rest of this uh, prototyping and also uh, continuing our research. And so, uh, thank you. We'd like to thank Built Worlds and uh, everyone for having us. And uh, again, yeah. I guess that's uh, wraps it up. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. That was excellent. Uh, I know you guys put a lot of hard work into that, and we're very excited to see where you go in your careers. The next part of the show uh, will uh, feature about a 15-minute presentation from each of our panelists, followed by a panel discussion. The first panelist, uh, I'm going to read a brief bio. Obviously, you could find a much longer version of this uh, online, but uh, for the sake of time. Uh, our next uh, speaker will be Dr. Barack Korshanavis. He's a dean's professor at the University of Southern California, having affiliations with aerospace, mechanical, aeronautics, biomedical, civil, and environmental and industrial systems engineering, and is the director of the Center for Rapid Automated Fabrication Technologies at USC. His computerized construction technology, contour crafting, which he's going to speak about tonight, won the grand prize among over a thousand globally competing technologies in the 2014 NASA Tech Briefs Create the Future Design Contest. He has a much more extensive and impressive background, but like I said, for the sake of time, I would like to invite him to the stage now uh, for him to speak for himself. And uh, please welcome Dr. Barack Hussein to the stage. Hello. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, technology that probably started all of this. Uh, I started this concept about 20 years ago, actually. I was uh, one of the early guys who got excited about 3D printing, and I have developed several 3D printing technologies. But this one is really near and dear to my heart. It has taken very long, uh, and still uh, none of these are really commercialized. Uh, I'm not very surprised uh, because disruptive technologies always have a lot of uh, struggles to find their marketplace. Uh, and uh, going back, you know, to like a telephone by Graham Bell, you know, at the time of telegraph. Uh, you might think that that was a slam dunk success, but it wasn't. Uh, there's a famous quotation by the president of Western Union who said, when we have telegraph, who needs telephone? And he was very right, because we're talking about the time where buildings were not wired up for telephone. In fact, uh, at that time, uh, John Rockefeller was selling kerosene for lighting to the buildings. That's how he got to become a billionaire. Uh, there wasn't even electricity in the houses. Uh, yeah, it took 15 years before the first application of telephone, real application of telephone emerged. The jet engine took about 40 years. Uh, the inventor uh, was 35 years old when he invented it. When uh, the first commercial airliner, Pan Am, used jet engine, he was 75 years old. Um, all right. So I hope. It will be not uh, as long as it took for uh, jet engine. Uh, 
but we are all trying to get these things uh, hopefully used. Um, all right, to put things in perspective, I don't know how many of you are, uh, uh, you have technical background or are into 3D printing, uh, but a lot of people are confused as why 3D printing all of a sudden. Uh, the reality is that there are three classes of fabrication technologies. One is subtractive, which is highly automated. Computer numerical control uh, is not commonplace. There are millions of them practically in use everywhere in different companies, uh, factories, and so on. Um, still the most precise uh, methods at meso scale. Uh, the disadvantage is that uh, they're not fully automated. For example, you have to change the resting face of the part in order to be able to access the other parts. Accessibility is an issue. You cannot do very complex internal geometries. And of course, it's uh, very wasteful. It uh, creates a lot of chips. Uh, the second class of fabrication technologies, which is pretty ancient, is uh, additive technology using molds. Ever since humans discovered fire, they noticed that some low melting metals in the rocks that they set around the fire melted, and after they cooled down, took the shape of the surrounding. Uh, pottery work was common, so they made uh, these molds out of uh, clay material, very high temperature material, of course, compared to those uh, metals. And then we have all these fascinating objects that they can, they made, you know, go to Vatican Museum, go to all the ancient museums you see uh, about the amazing metal work that people did like as, as, as early as uh, 3,500 years ago. One of them is a beautiful uh, wheel made in Iran. Uh, uh, in the museum in Tehran, uh, that always fascinates me. Um, then there is formative processes, uh, which is typically with sheet metal, uh, and um, car bodies and so on are made with that. The uh, desire to automate additive fabrications has always been there, but it's very hard to build the stuff without more. Um, because um, the way uh, human sculptors, for example, build 3D objects in the middle of the air, but they use powerful uh, dexterity of human hand and the strong uh, cognitive power of human brain. But also they use a hybrid process of adding, subtracting, forming, you know, all of those to make those things. So about 30 years ago, somebody thought about, well, instead of building uh, 3D objects directly in 3D, let's slice them down into a bunch of 2Ds and stack them. It's much more conceivable you can build 2D stuff, much easier, right? And uh, hence uh, the series of the technologies that you see around these days. So digital uh, additive manufacturing or 3D printing started about 30 years ago. The concept is based on layering uh, fabrication um, step, uh, layer by layer. And, and building up the object. This concept, while it is new in the field of manufacturing, it is very old in construction. This building was built by 3D printing about 2,500 years ago in southern Iran. I'm from Iran originally, so I love Iranian architecture. Um, so building layer by layer, like brick laying, is a standard way in, 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 in uh, construction. So when I came to that realization about 20 years ago, it became obvious to me that really the true potential of 3D printing is really not in manufacturing. Still, none of these 3D printing methods can match the performance of standard, conventional uh, manufacturing technologies. Uh, precision, uh, integrity of the parts, surface quality, and all that, they cannot match that. Uh, there are 2,500 manufacturing technologies, according to Society of Manufacturing Engineers, about that many. And none of them are becoming obsolete because everyone is good for a certain niche. So do not assume that 3D printing is going to revolutionize, change everything. No, it's not going to do that. It is very non-serious technology in manufacturing. Hardly they can use it for, for 
real end product. So they're working a lot, of, a lot on it, but don't assume that they're gonna make everything obsolete. There's a lot of hype about 3D printing. So, but in construction, I said that it is already proven for many millennia. All we have to bring to this is uh, basically the, the set of the tools uh, of digital uh, automation, which are already around, but uh, there are some re-engineering, some uh, integration issues, and, and uh, uh, the larger scale problem has got its own uh, aspects, uh, and, and it's going to take a while before these things are becoming, uh, will become commonplace. Uh, but the need is definitely there. About two billion people are living in that substandard condition. You know, according to Maslow, food and shelter are basic physiological needs of people. Without that, they don't elevate themselves to a higher level of human aspiration. And, and two billion people, of course, are being wasted because they cannot go to a higher level of human aspiration. You know, this could be future inventors, scientists, uh, philosophers, whatever. Uh, also human disaster, uh, the, the natural disaster cause real difficulty for humanity. Uh, same with war. Uh, this is the Fukushima disaster uh, in a very advanced country, <laughs> Japan. But also look at the condition of Syrian refugees. About five million of them lived in tents for so many months uh, in the hot, uh, hot desert conditions in the Middle East. And this is 21st century. Really not acceptable. Well, what is contour crafting? The concept is simple. Uh, these uh, wonderful students already kind of described it, so I won't spend too much time. Um, I wanted to build actually faster. My intention was not to get into construction. I wanted to speed up 3D printing. And I knew that if you increase layer thickness, you lose surface quality. So I came up with this idea of putting a trowel at the mouth of the nozzle and then controlling the angle of the trowel. And um, that's how the whole thing started, you know. And then one thing led to another. And um, I, I got into different, trying different materials. I initially, I started with plastics and then into ceramics and then finally concrete. Um, it took about uh, six years for me to get there. Uh, so it wasn't premeditated. Yeah, these are some of the parts that we built. As you see, the surface quality is wonderful. Um, then I built this larger scale uh, system, machine, and uh, produced concrete structures. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, this structure is in, the, in a museum in Chicago somewhere. Uh, this uh, are some of the components of the technology. Regulating pressure of the, 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 the flow of concrete is not easy. I focused uh, on uh, making something that would actually work. Making a simple demonstration um, showing that concrete can be Extruded and built layer by layer is one thing, but making sure that several tons of material can go through those mechanisms without wearing things out and all, uh, and being also insensitive to variations in the material were kind of um, uh, focus that I had. So as a result of this, I had to invent my way through this process, uh, about 25 patents, US patents, on this technology. And uh, so you can imagine um, how difficult it would be to build such a structure by hand, very expensive, but this one is pretty uh, fast. If you show this a uh, few videos, I don't have too much more time, so uh, I'll go quickly over the rest of this. Um, yeah, well, this is uh, showing the concept. You can take this machine, which would be relatively light, and um, you bring the material, architectural design on a flash drive, and then the building would be built very rapidly on site. Um, so the advantages were mentioned. Uh, 
again by the students. Uh, you can have wonderful architectural flexibility. This is kind of boxy design. I don't want to make it difficult for my students to animate this. Um, but you can imagine all kinds of curvature. Uh, it's a waste free computer precisely puts what's needed there. And uh, it is very safe. You take people out of construction job. You add a lot to safety. Uh, every year, about 60,000 people die on construction sites. 10% of those deaths happen in this country, which has got a pretty stringent uh, safety requirement. So you can imagine how bad it is. It is the worst job as far as safety is concerned, worse than agriculture and mining. Um, and of course, uh, it's not only fatalities, but a lot of spinal cord injuries, huge uh, burden on the medical system, financial system of a, of a country. And of course, in the end, customers pay for all that. Companies have to insure themselves, there's litigations and all that. Uh, and that's what adds to the cost per square foot of uh, building that you pay for. So uh, let's advance quickly to the next one. Yeah, when you build layer by layer, what you have not yet built is not on your way. Therefore, you can manage to put other stuff inside of it. So we can do automated uh, reinforcement uh, with these segmented rebars. Um, Next video, please. Well, okay, we bypassed um, automated plumbing and electrical. Those can be done. But this is uh, that machine that I showed you building a wall. You can appreciate the speed at which a wall is being erected. This one builds uh, the, pa the, the thing uh, with a hollow structure, corrugated in internal structure. Um, this concrete is pretty strong, 10,000 PSI, uh, high performance concrete. Um, also, you know, this is equivalent of like cinder block, except that it is better than cinder block. Number one, it is monolithic. Number two, it creates a truss structure, which is much stronger than these uh, vertical ribs. Uh, okay, let's go back to the Presentation. Yeah, so you can have the design like this uh, with curvatures and so on. Uh, but other implementations uh, could include application for larger scale uh, buildings like uh, apartment complexes, uh, schools, hospitals, government buildings. Or we can build high rises by a platform that self uh, climbs the structure. Another beautiful building in Iran. This is uh, about 200 years old. Uh, it used to be the house of a carpet merchant in an earthquake prone area of Iran. You know, the whole Iran is earthquake prone like California. Um, but this thing is standing and the reason is not that uh, it uses uh, good material. No, it is adobe material with straw, uh, clay and straw. Uh, the, what gives it the strength is really the curvature. Curvature always makes stuff stronger. Um, you can try a piece of paper and you can see if you keep it uh, flat, it keeps collapsing on itself, but you can curve it a tiny bit and you can hold it upright. Um, so with the same material, you can gain more strength if you start curving the buildings. And the curvature does not have to be too much. It could even be such that it won't be noticeable. Uh, yeah, this could be pretty organic inside. So these uh, structures can be built right now with very uh, uh, expert uh, craftsmen, but uh, you can program those methods and do it robotically. We've gone uh, to applications beyond the Earth. Uh, for the last six years, I've been working on a NASA project to build on Moon and Mars using contour crafting, and we have developed new aspects of the technology that uses in situ material without water, uh, forms of concrete that we can extrude and actually demonstrate it uh, already, uh, uh, certain applications. And 
this uh, technology has got, it's, this project has got to its third phase now. Um, and uh, right now it is a relatively uh, big uh, uh, NASA-wide project. Hopefully it will be used eventually to get us to the other planets. This is Martian material simulant that we have used. You see the structures that we have built, again, without water, purely out of the material that is on Mars. Well, uh, competitive landscape, let me go over this. But environmental impact is pretty nice. You know, uh, uh, most of the uh, advantages come from people not driving back and forth to construction site for so long, right? The amount of emission that they create by driving, the fuel they consume, the load they put on traffic, is slowing down the traffic, making everybody else consume more electricity, produce more emission, is basically what is uh, giving the advantage to this. Speed is the main advantage, really, which also uh, has the advantage of uh, cost to market, you know? Time, excuse me, time to market. Uh, that's very important in construction. So uh, we created the Center uh, for Rapid Automated Fabrication Technologies at USC with the goal, the slogan of uh, building a house in a day. And there are several components to this that we're um, looking at, including uh, the material, robotics, architecture, social aspects, and so on. Yeah, at, as uh, Dimitri mentioned, uh, in 2014, NASA gave a grand uh, prize to contour crafting. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Before I end, I just have to say that uh, some student asked me, well, is there anything else to do in this field <laughs> as far as research goes? I told them for the next 300 years, uh, there will be, or more, there will be always uh, room for innovation and research. This is just the beginning, right? In 2D technologies, 2D printing, they say Gutenberg started, still there is innovation. I designed my tie and 3D printed it. <laughs> the company 3D printed it. So this is a beginning of uh, a lot of future activities. It's very hard to imagine what's going to be in the future. Uh, it's going to be used on Earth, in space, under the sea, and so on. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for that very uh, inspirational and informative presentation. Our next presenter is uh, James Wolf, the CEO from D-Shape Enterprises. James Wolf is a futurist, techno philosopher, and one of the world's top emerging technology experts. Wolf is a graduate of John Hopkins University and New York Law School, specializing in business, finance, and intellectual property law. Among his corporate portfolio accomplishments, Wolf is the co-founder of Deep Space Industries, a California NASA Ames Space Center-based asteroid mining company and co-founder and CEO of D-Shape Enterprises, a mega-scale 3D printing company which holds the first permit for 3D printed construction in the United States and works closely with the European Space Agency. Uh, he's also an executive board member at large of the United Nations Association where he serves on the Sustainability and Economic Development Committee. Please welcome James to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully it's on. Yes, there's Michael good. Thank you. Hi. So I'm really excited to be here today. I'd like to thank Built Worlds for inviting me. And again, the incredible work done by the Northwestern team and, of course, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Professor Kosha Nevis. So today I'm here to 
explore some of the recent developments, exciting new developments with D-Shape Enterprises. In fact, some of the images that you're going to see today are, we're just debuting for the first time, we're disclosing them, so I'm very excited to be here tonight. So we'll start with uh, D-Shape Enterprises and essentially the technology that, uh, that encompasses mega-scale 3D printing. So since the 19th century, of course, the construction industry has been using Portland cement to cast concrete into a formwork containing a steel cage, uh, is cementing bricks and stones using masonry, and yet despite the availability of construction machinery such as cranes, pumps, concrete mixers, and molds and formworks, the building industry is currently reliant on the manual intervention of professional builders who are the hands which operate the industry. We see an emerging ecosystem with respect to the building construction industry that includes both robotic automation as well as uh, intelligent BIM building information modeling systems working together. So as you see here, uh, this is uh, our CNN article with respect to our upstate New York Gardener project where we were awarded a, a permit for the first 3D printed construction of an estate. So we're starting with the jacuzzi, then we go to the carports, the water fountains, and we get to the structural load bearing materials. So as we begin on this journey through D-Shape, I'd like to introduce you to our latest models. Uh, this is a 6x8 uh, 3D printer system ready to ship. Uh, this particular model is sitting in Italy right now. However, we have developed a system to mass commercialize our f systems finally after 10 to 15 years of development. This is our inventor, Enrico Dini. Uh, he is an uh, Italian uh, uh, civil engineer uh, at Pisa University. Uh, he spent his entire career in the sector of mechanics, automation, and robotics, and uh, manufacturing automatic machines. And he works in cooperation with Fosters of Partners, Zaha Hadid Architects, and the European Space Agency. He started with this structural truss frame technology uh, that is, utilizes uh, sand deposition and uh, binder aggregate. And here, essentially, it equates to the 1950s hi-fi. So this was our initial platforms for innovation and development with respect to both the software and the hardware innovations that have developed subsequently. One of our early projects have been, has been the Red Yalara. Uh, it's a high sand deposition printed object standing at 28 meters and constructed in components and parts. Here, uh, for the first time, we're disclosing a bunker that we 3D printed for the Italian Defense Agency. Uh, as you can see, it withstood 50 calibers and mortars. But more to the point, it is part of this paradigm shift with respect to in-situ resource utilization where we're using on-site resources to reduce the cost of logistics, which also reduces the carbon footprint associated with this kind of technology. Here again is an artificial coral reef that we've been producing. This has been one of our primary markets thus far. The situation with respect to global coral reef is critical at this point, and we've been developing an algorithm for the 3D printing of porous yet uh, geometrically unique uh, coral formations that yet are artificial, still provide coral and marine life the ability to grab onto the reefs. And, uh, and we believe that this system being demonstrated and tested across the world at this point is a viable solution to the uh, critical issues before us. Now again, it doesn't really uh, answer the uh, question with respect to ocean acidification, but we believe this is one of the important solutions. Uh, here we are uh, with respect to a cast bridge that we produce. We do a lot of these sculptural one-offs at our Italian facility. Our headquarters there is located in an aircraft hangar where we have our manufacturing plant as well as storage for a lot of these one-offs that we've been producing. And here we're going to get into the upstate New York Gardener construction project. This is the site upon which it sits in Gardiner, New York. As you can see, there is a five acre uh, uh, plan for the estate with a driving path, a walking path, a garden, natural pond, and pools. 
we want to demonstrate the aspects of this new emerging concept of integrating automation and 3D printing into construction in the construction paradigm. And through that, this site is providing us the ability to demonstrate this technology. As you can see, we've done the renderings and created the initial site diagrams for the pool, the carport, and the house, and the pool house. And we are continuing to develop and refine our designs as we move forward into our construction phase. So at this point on the site, we've run electricity, we've run the pipes, and we've created the foundation. So we're ready at this point once the thaw occurs to get to the real work at, uh, with respect to 3D printing. Here's another topographical map. Here is the permit that we received for the 3D printing uh, uh, construction project. And here is the first rendering that I'm going to go through and show you. So what we're looking at right now is uh, the uh, pool with the cabanas and these mo uh, multiple independent structures within them. Here's another view. Yet another. I like that one particularly. And so with respect to large scale 3D printing, we're integrating automated and uh, manufacturing and additive manufacturing processes into our design process. And through that, we're utilizing polymer desktop 3D printer systems and producing them in scale to a topographical map at our architectural firm. Here's another image of the renderings. Uh, here, this is a project that uh, we've uh, developed. It's a, it, actually, this is a great image to show you the process of the technology. So what we're doing here is we're uh, laying down a granulate uh, surface, and then uh, upon that surface, with multiple nozzles, we extrude a, a, a liquid binder. And through that, a chemical reaction occurs that solidifies the stone. In fact, so with respect to the technology itself, uh, the 3D model must be broken down into discrete layers in a computer program and determine where and how much of the structural ink should be sprayed. And so that's where a lot of our early work occurred with respect to the design of our proprietary software systems. We can use local materials, crushed rock, sand, and gravel, as you would have noticed from that site. Uh, this is, again, an emerging uh, area with respect to in situ resource utilization for construction purposes. Uh, and in addition to local materials, we can use recycled materials. So we have an active materials science program. For example, shredded tires and leftover plant matter we've utilized in some of our initial de de uh, designs to craft pieces of unique texture and color. So we've done both, uh, both types of 3D printed large scale designs. Now D-Shape is a sustainable technology. Whatever unused material can be used again to craft unique and organic designs. Now before printing, uh, as I said, the 3D model must be broken down and layered and that's part of our proprietary software development. When running, a printer head of 300 mo nozzles at two, uh, 20 millimeter uh, intervals runs the entire length of the x-axis. A single print layer is made of several passes interlaced together. At this rate, 5 to 20 centimeters per hour can be achieved. With our new designs that we're working on in our machine shop back in Tribeca, we're actually seeing a leap forward with respect to our speed and capability and resolution. I think we're really onto something with some of our new technology. At this rate, again, uh, 5 to 20 centimeters, uh, input costs are fairly low. Uh, solid and liquid binders are cost competitive, and aggregates are derived from fine powder waste from local quarries. The physical characteristics of the printed material are comparable to stone that the raw inputs are derived from. According to recent research, the ultimate tensile strength of our printed material is around 25 MPa. Uh, limestone and other engineered stones often fall within the same range characteristics. Printed designs are often very rough because of the bleeding of deposited liquid by capillary action. However, we've been developing post-processing technology as well and automating that into our larger uh, format 3D printer systems. Uh, otherwise, again, many finished parts had to be sanded down to achieve suitable finishes. 
Uh, the clearest advantage of our technology over other methods of casting or CNC manufacturing is the sheer flexibility it gives to designers. For example, voids within the structure can be created very easily. No complex molds uh, need to be made so that a complex shape can be cast. It can be simply CAD modeled and then printed. With the D-shaped D technology, straight edges are simply not necessary because it's, it's cheaper and easier. Uh, organic shapes of all sizes are possible. And one of the unique characteristics of D-Shape is that we are embedded within an architectural firm. And my business partner, Adam Kushner, is truly a visionary with respect to his architecture and design. And part of it is uh, this way that he constructs uh, buildings with a biomimetic natural feel and I think that's captured very well in the technology. So, so creating this tool to enable architects of the future I think uh, is a very exciting uh, prospect. So moving forward this is very exciting so uh, two weeks ago Amazon had a secret conference here in Palm Springs in California and we were fortunate enough to ship a machine there and print for Jeff Bezos and NASA and some of the materials as you can see we were doing some landscape architecture for them but it's indicative of our new system technology so this is one of our new large scale 6x6 by eight machines. Uh, as you can see, structural trusses, uh, the axis nozzles frame. But in addition to that, uh, we have integrated some new technology, such as uh, granular recapture capabilities. This machine uh, was produced for Spain. Uh, we started building it in 2014. And it's indicative of some of the new approaches that we're looking at with respect to our large scale manufacturing. Now, there are several problems within the large scale 3D printer industry. The low hanging fruit with respect to uh, fabrication is, uh, it has been the sculptures. It's ha it has been the one off projects for the defense agencies and, and, uh, and it has been artificial coral reefs. However, as we move forward in terms of the context with respect to structural load bearing uh, buildings and, and the design and manufacturing thereof, we're looking to new uh, solutions. One of the solutions that we're actively uh, developing has been uh, helix fibers and multi-fiber mixes which we believe have the potential to not only uh, uh, mitigate some of the structural load bearing concerns of 3D printed with rebar but but really uh, make a re that introduction of rebar into the system obsolete. So we're looking at uh, super to, uh, cement essentially with respect to uh, impregnated uh, cements through po uh, advanced polymers, uh, metal helix fibers, uh, and, and some of the other technologies that, uh, that we are also developing in-house. Another aspect of our uh, uh, innovation as of, uh, as of just a couple years ago has been the automation of the process. So here we're looking at uh, automated vacuuming systems that work with respect to the infill of the construction uh, design and indirectively uh, uh, remove the material in a dynamic fashion. And I think that's opening up a whole new world for us with respect to the capabilities of the machine, especially as we move forward and, uh, and incorporate this technology into our mobile rover platforms that we're looking into, as well as other, uh, uh, other designs. For example, uh, last year we completed a uh, 3D printer and we integrated it into a cargo shipping container. And through that, we delivered it uh, on site to, uh, uh, to this locale. Uh, and in partnership with Buscalis, what we did is we dredged the sand, again, ISRU, in situ resource utilization, we dredged the sand out of the seafloor and use that in terms of the uh, aggregate and the binder. Uh, so here, there's another issue with respect to the technology, which is scalability. So it still requires a lot of manual labor. Uh, it requires the architects to have an understanding of the design characteristics. And, uh, and it requires an extensive experience and understanding of the machines themselves for maintenance and operation thereof. He, uh, here, pictured here, this is uh, Enrico at, uh, the, in Palm Springs. And we're designing this coral reef. We printed this coral reef structure uh, for the event. Uh, it was called Mars, uh, which was uh, the uh, machine uh, automation and, uh, and uh, 
R, I don't remember what R stands for, but then space. <laughs> remember that. So again, we're looking at, in terms of the ecosystem and how the ecosystem is going to develop, we're looking at new technologies. One is Gensler's uh, drone solution. In terms of how we can approach the construction, the current construction paradigm and value add innovative technologies and services to reduce the cost, improve the capabilities, improve the quality, and uh, as, uh, as has been mentioned, improve the safety margins, which is a very uh, large concern within the construction industry. And furthermore, so we're looking towards partnerships with uh, other major companies. And with respect to these companies, we're looking at how we can integrate with their departments that are also designing new technology to be integrated within the construction paradigm. Uh, one option is uh, mobile scaffolding and, uh, and its integration with robotic bipedal uh, systems that can actively remove, uh, remove objects from the site or deliver uh, containers or boxes. So it's part of this larger automation and uh, artificial intelligence uh, 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 development in terms of the industry. So why 3D printing? Uh, again, oh, this has been brought up many times before now. Safer, less labor, customization, precision, less material waste, uh, usage of local materials, cheaper, faster, environmental impacts, uh, and redefining the definition of a general contractor or architect. Uh, so I'm hearing now uh, this term that is uh, uh, that, uh, that sort of signifies where we're headed in the industry, and, and the, so uh, the, the industry is saying, well, that the, uh, in terms of architecture, uh, you have uh, uh, pick and drop architecture, where you're designing the uh, the uh, the system with respect to the uh, the. Uh, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, fire systems, and that's getting integrated uh, within the, dis the sub-disciplines. And then all you have to do is really click a button and uh, through the process of teleoperation and automation through, uh, through off-site remote, uh, uh, remote command centers, you can manage s several fleets of automated 3D printer systems at the same time. And that is one example of our approach to solving the scalability issue. So uh, in closing, we've uh, had many projects with the European Space Agency at this point. Our, uh, the one project I, I'll bring up here has been our collaboration with Alta Space. We produced a 1.5 ton shield uh, with respect to the, uh, the lunar uh, simulant, regolith simulant. And the purpose of this shielding is for micrometeorite and radiation. We believe that this is a critical technology with respect to lunar development because utilizing this technology with in-situ resource utilization allows you to uh, produce a uh, on-site uh, habitats that are uh, protected against solar flares, as well as the significant micrometeorite impacts, as well as the abrasion of the regolith itself, which, as the Apollo missions have shown us, uh, the abrasion is significant. The microscopic uh, regolith particles are incredibly abrasive. They took out a, 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 a bump, uh, the, the bumper of a, a rover at one point uh, during the Apollo series. And the, the lesson to be learned from there is that everything with respect to the lunar development and the lunar infrastructure needs to be 3D printed. You need uh, 3D printed landing pads, uh, 3D printed roads, 3D printed hangars, and of course the habitats. So thank you very much, and, uh, and I'll turn over my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. From under the sea to the moon. And now for our final uh, presenter, Maged Gerges, a uh, designer from SOM. Uh, Maged uh, was the 2013 recipient of the SOM Foundation's Travel and Research, Research Fellowship. He received his uh, Master's of Architecture from University of Illinois at Chicago in 2013 as well. Uh, and in addition to various other international accolades uh, for his talent in architecture, he played an integral uh, role in the Additive manufacture, Manufacturing Integrated Energies Project, which was a joint research initiative between SOM uh, the Department of Energy and Oak Ridge National Laboratory where they demonstrated uh, the ca their capacity to 3D print a vehicle and a building that were able to generate, store, as well as wirelessly transmit their energies back and forth between each other. So uh, please welcome Maged 
to the stage as soon as his microphone gets turned on. Excellent. Good. Good. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for Bird Wars to uh, put this together. Uh, this is very exciting, um, and I'm sure majority of the audience now is pretty familiar with the 3D printing technology, what are the limitations, what are the capability of it, and um, uh, let me just jump into the, the I will, tonight I'll be talking about AMI. AMI stands for Additive Manufacturing Integrated Energy, and uh, probably by now we understand that Additive ma Manufacturing is the, in tandem another term that also we know as 3D printing, which basically it's not really 3D, it's a 2D layering of, of uh, several or different materials. Uh, as Dimitri mentioned, it's, uh, AMI is uh, a combination of a one-year effort out of five years. That's why we call it AMI 1.0 between University of Tennessee, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, and uh, all under the umbrella of something called the Governor's Chair Program. And the Governor's Chair is a five-year program. Normally, uh, it attracts uh, scientists, researchers from um, all over the nation. And uh, normally there are 18 of them. The, uh, it's a grant, and they do a research in certain libraries with, uh, with a collaboration with Oak Ridge. And it was the first time in the history that they bring a designer to the game, which is one of our uh, urban planning designers. So the first thing when he brought to the table is that what can we do together that we can do by ourselves? Like we can design things, but, and then also we can do research. But what could come out? when we bring all these efforts together. And uh, we thought, OK, there's certain problems in the urban or the building environment, right? Uh, always the, uh, the lack of energy or uh, the speed of manufacturing or uh, construction methods, and how we can collaborate and use all these facilities that's available for the, through university or through Oak Ridge Research Labs to create something that's unique and something a prototype could be hopefully a, 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 a success or uh, some solutions for problems that we're currently facing. And this is where Amy came about. So um, Amy, at a manufacturing power, we learned it's a 3D printing portion, right? And the uh, integrated energy portion, which basically it's not only a 3D printed building, it's uh, also a 3D printed car. And it's the third 3D printed car printed by Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And, uh, funded by the Department of Energy, they could make an engine that not only can uh, generate enough energy to run the car, but also to power the house. So uh, eventually, you can be working off the grid in remote areas and so forth. So uh, there was a lot of players. There were almost, almost uh, 25 industry partners involved. One of the major uh, things that we wanted to test is that uh, a vacuum insulated panels that's only one inch thick, but it has our value of 40. So we were thinking, this is where all this research was actually started. They said, okay, we wanna in incorporate 3D printing layers with this new very thin layer with very high insulation. It's never been used to construction bus businesses before. So what the impact that could happen? So this is why we see in the development of the form, the first one was just a cargo. Basically, it's a box with 3D, two 3D player sandwiches with the insulation in the middle. And then they worked for like three months, and then uh, one of our designer partner approached me and he said, would you like to be involved in that? And I said, of course, I, I, I do that for free anyway. I, it's one of my side jobs that I, I do uh, design research. And one of my wildest dreams to just get a a scale model 3D printed and put it on the, my desk, but to have an access to a full size 3D printer that's actually 20 feet by 10 feet by eight, that's the largest plastic printer. It's like a, your MakerBot on Stroid. So what can you do with that? So the first thing right away is, okay, one of the biggest challenges in architecture is to, d to d design and build doubly curved surfaces or very complex surfaces because each, each portion of it's unique. You need to make mold for each one, so the price is really skyrocket. When you get to really extra construction, you can kiss all this goodbye because you can have to really make your design even more simpler and more simpler because of the cost. So this is the final form, and it's all in the ring. So it started by a lot of people thought that the whole building came out of the printer. The building actually is four, 40, 45 feet wide by 14 by 10. 
So what we did is actually I wanted to take advantage of the scale of the printer. So I designed one ring that can fit the whole printer. And what, what I wanted to do is that we tried to push the limitation of the construction method. So now we have one inch thick of insulation and another half inch of 3D printers layers. So you end up with only one, almost an inch and a half that has a potentially our value of 37. So not only this, in the ring, we try to integrate everything you can imagine in your wall section that you can grow up to about, I don't know, 10 inches with potentially, if you're lucky enough, you have our value of 18 to only one and a half inch thick or two inch thick. So basically, it, it has the structure system. So it prints the truss, it prints the window framing, it prints the exterior panels, the interior panels, all the conduits, so all the wiring system, it's already integrated within the ring. So imagine all your wall sand which is being printed is being produced at the same time simultaneously without any assembly, without anything. It's just coming with the printer ready for any non 3D printed parts to be integrated. The accuracy of the printer was very high and it, it was demonstrated when we started to add like the glass or for example one of the um, industry partners that we had with Alcoa so we used their doors and the door would fit perfectly inside the 3D prints. As you can see here the component number three those are the, the insulation panels and at the top we found a very nice um, PV panels that's flexible so you can bend in two directions so it, it followed nicely with the with the double curvature of the surface. Uh, as the students were mentioning, like, we're the, one of the biggest challenges with 3D printing in this method and that scale is that in the Z direction, you can't build up an overhang or cantilever pieces. And also, the delamination of the Z of the layers. So that's why, why you had to introduce a tension rod that holds all the rings together. So this, is show, this slide shows the, the main component, the ring, and how it comes together to form the whole building. And this is a, a guide, so even the, in the delivery method was kind of unique for that project. So I will, get, I will show you later how is that difference. So this is a guide for the parts that were sent along with the IGS file to be exact replica of the model that we already did on the, on the computer. So these are the, some of the drawings, the plans, and sections. And uh, in regard of this traveling angle of the nozzle, every single detail in the building has to be modeled digitally because there was no add-on pieces. So all the details, like when we do construction drawings, we don't detail, we, for example, we don't model the extrusion of the aluminum frame of a curtain wall system in all the buildings. Maybe we have a detailed drawing that shows that, but in this case, every single detail has to be modeled and has to be modeled algorithmically very fast that can really adopt any changes. So this is more technical drawings. I want to get into the, the actual construction photos. Uh, this is an initial concept for what we call it the console because it, it was a demonstration project. So it's a demo for what could happen. So it's an island that can host um, all the your kitchen appliances, um, the cutting board, or also uh, water faucet, and then we used to call it the brain until we introduced the toilet into it, so we stopped calling it that. Um, and we had General Electric uh, as one of the parts, so they were developing uh, this kitchen island, so we, we kind of modified it to have like, a Murphy bit into it, an LCD screen, so you can people see how the model was built. And then finally, this is what I'm coming about. So normally, um, when architects design something, we start with schematic design, design development, and then we have to handle construction documents to a developer or a manufacturer to start to create their own workshop drawings. Through this process, a lot of the design intent could lost in translation. And uh, what I call in this process is there's nothing lost in translation. So basically, it's an IGS model that creates exactly replica of all the surface, all the geometry that was built in the computer with all the details. That puts more responsibility on the, on the architect because the precision of the model has to really be unmatched before because the liability issue now is starting to become all on the, on the model itself. And now with about a 100 megabyte model, which there is a new term on the internet now, it's called feasible, which is any information or data that can potentially be a physical model. Like you can download the model and then 3D print it and you have exact replica of that thing. So, um, 
this is uh, the scale, like the, the layering we added. It's, so it's about one third of an inch. And this is the first successful ring. We, of course, as any res design research project, uh, we had a lot of different failures. And uh, we saw that we can have a traveling angle of uh, 25 degrees, but it ended up being 40. So all this, the, the model, the, the actual architectural model changed almost 60 times to adapt to all these changes on the fly within hours. Not other than that, because the whole project time was about seven months, and it, the whole rings was printed in two weeks, and it was assembled in another two weeks. And this is a warehouse for a Clinton Home, one of the largest um, fabricated, manuf manufactured home in Tennessee. Uh, there were, you can see the scale of the ring compared to, this is a, was a really a big guy. So you can tell, the, nobody really imagined the size or the sheer size of that model when it's the first ring start to get together. So that, uh, they were all assembled on a, on a regular uh, chassis that's manufactured by them because it was intended to be mobile, so it would move from one state to another. Last, m last month was in a, in a building, international building show at Las Vegas. And I like this image. It reminds me of like an alien, a shot from an alien trilogy movie. So basically, because of the roughness of the material and it could puncture the insulated panel, it has to be coated uh, in a fashion so it will not really lose the R value of the insulation panels that we're using. And this is the first time on the road before adding the canopies. And this is the first time when it's all was assembled. The interior. And there is some interesting architecture thing about the opening gills. So when you enter the space from one direction, it feels very close and very intimate. But then when you go to the other direction, it has this panoramic view when the gills start to open up and penetrate the light floods the space. Some of the details, some of the how, the qual. So this is, it was really breathtaking to see the, the model that works for, you work on for six months exactly the same with every single curvature, curvature and every panel, despite it's unique, they're seamless, continuously connecting to each other. More, uh, so these are some renderings that we did right before the final model was done that could potentially show what could happen when like some application of of 3D printing of that object because it could be in remote areas, it could be in a very cold climate because of the high insulation value of it. And of course, the car, both of them, they can charge each other because the solar panel on the rooftop can also, uh, through a wireless pad, charge the, the car engine, and the car engine can also charge the building. And of course, uh, some of the presenters mentioned that uh, how disaster zones and how you can really want to reach these areas very quickly. So you could either transport the 3D printed uh, objects or not, it could be like a medical center because it can really e easily be cleaned up and it can easily be sanitized. And also you could actually send the file by via internet and it could be 3D printed on site. And finally it could be remote and this is a real, I, I love the image. And then finally, I will just play a, a three minute video if this was not clear enough. It just shows the whole process and what's the intent of the whole project.
please welcome uh, Dr. Koshinavis and James Wolf back to the stage, and we can have a nice discussion here. Um, yeah. Grab a water for myself. All right, uh, thank you all for, again, those very interesting presentations. It's nice to see, or at least from my perspective, as I mentioned to James earlier, that you seem to be all working on uh, very complementary technologies with one another. So that's very fascinating. In keeping with the theme of tonight and built worlds in general, I thought we'd uh, start by having a discussion about um, materials and how those materials are, and how materiality is being um, acknowledged by the industry at large. Um, I don't know if, have you had any feedback from concrete companies or steel manufacturers, and how do they seem to be responding to uh, this technology? And I open that to anyone. Is your microphone? Or? Oh. This is a 3D printer. Uh, or, or a printer, let's say, uh, industry. Much like 2D printers, uh, paper printers, the main money in the business of it will not be made by selling machines, but by selling the ink, <laughs> cartridges. Uh, currently, the paper printers are almost sold at cost, sometimes lower than manufacturing costs so that they get you to adopt that printer and buy cartridges. Uh, and cartridges are not very cheap, right? <laughs> you know. And the same, I think, will hold true in, in case of um, large-scale 3D printers, uh, whether it is concrete uh, printers or, or polymer printers. Um, the, the, based on my own experience, all the concrete uh, or cement uh, producers are very excited. I've been contacted by almost all of them, all of the major ones. Uh, yeah, they are uh, one of the main advocates of the technology. They can't wait for it to appear. Yes, so material sciences is a critical component of large-scale 3D printing. And what makes it so difficult is that with each new location, you have a different composition of materials and aggregates within the uh, within the logistic supply chain of the project. So that requires an experience and an understanding of how the technology is going to interact with these different uh, chemical compositions. Now we've been developing new materials and, uh, and metamaterials with respect to the impregnation of concretes with polymers, cellulitic fibers, glass fibers, and we've been finding some very unique results with respect to the properties of some of these materials. And I think that we're just beginning to explore the applications. Uh, for example, if you had a certain component within the structural load-bearing building, or if it was a mechanical component or a structural component that has a unique property because, for example, it is impregnated with a specific type of, of uh, cellulitic fiber that, uh, that is stretchable, or again, the uh, helix components. What we've discovered is that because of the difficulty and the complexity associated with uh, each project and the logistics uh, of the materials for each project being different because of the localities, it creates an obstacle to scalability and it further requires a lot of expertise on our side to understand how to uh, work with those materials. What we learned from uh, this project is that one of the biggest challenges was the material. The material itself, it was very heavy and it's not biodegradable, so it's not really very sustainable. So maybe, maybe in the future we, uh, despite the fact of all that potential of, of being having uh, that potential of all the whatever we 3D printed tests or parts, you can grind it back, basically it's plastic, you can just heat it up and 3D print other parts again from it, but still 
I don't believe, I think the research when it comes to material 3D printing is, should move away from the conventional materials that we know and we start to find some hybrid or some other materials that have more structure integrity than what we know with the conventional methods, but it's really tailored to that technology. So um, hopefully in the future we could come across some uh, material that's more sustainable, more uh, biodegradable, more uh, recycled, like 100% recyclable. That's, that's very interesting. Um, oh, please. Yes, if I may add to the conversation here with respect to materials. So I think that one approach in terms of developing the large scale, large format, mega scale 3D printer industry is to uh, build alliances within the industry as well as uh, at large for uh, for the development of a regulatory framework to begin experimenting with these materials. Uh, I think that there is an incredible incentivization through uh, existing frameworks such as LEED that incentivize developers to utilize sustainable materials. And one of the aspects of large-scale 3D printing is that if you're able to 3D print on site, you're reducing the logistics supply chain of these uh, that's associated with the current construction paradigm. And by doing that, you reduce the carbon footprint. So I believe that not only are there climate, uh, larger implications with respect to climate change, but in addition to that, it's the incentive that's there existing in other aspects of the architecture industry already, but just only needs to be applied to large scale 3D printing. I think we'll likely see that in the next few years. So I guess a good follow up to that would be, sorry about that. Um, what, what would the role of a general contractor uh, be? How would they integrate this machinery into their practices? Um, please uh, speak to that. You know, would, they, would they lease it? Would they become, are you guys planning on becoming contractors yourselves? Or uh, wh how does this change the current dynamic in the industry? And that's to anyone who cares to. Oh, well. uh. In uh, manufacturing, computer-aided design started much later than computer-aided manufacturing. Automation started first, and it took several decades before design came into play. Uh, I mentioned design because uh, in the world of construction, this component of automation happened much earlier than a potential future automation of actual construction. So design in construction has advanced a lot. There are a lot of architectural software. And uh, more uh, recently, there is BIM, Building Information Modeling, or 4D CAD. Uh, they add on to the design a number of other uh, databases, uh, including uh, those related to the logistics and project management, all the procurement, supply chain, scheduling, site planning, layout planning, uh, bill of materials, and all that uh, is now combined in a, a pretty comprehensive and, in cases, sophisticated uh, integrate the system of database and design while there is no automation in actual construction. So you see it's pretty much the opposite of what has happened in manufacturing. So what this basically means to me is that really the stage is set uh, for an automated system to come and just directly plug into this and remove all these people who are involved in currently taking the output of the BIM, which comes in blueprints and in certain uh, uh, inputs through a tablet that uh, uh, the construction people look at at the construction site and so on. Uh, integrate all of these. The situation is really ripe for integration of BIM and, and uh, construction activities. So, I think that's probably the most exciting part of uh, this whole development because it's going to definitely change uh, construction logistics. Uh, managing a construction activity, you know, my background come, uh, is manufacturing, 
So I have some familiarity with uh, managing manufacturing activities. You know, manufacturing also has the same kinds of logistics issues, but uh, it is more controllable because in manufacturing, typically the material and uh, workforce and all comes to a fixed location, which is a factory. And, uh, and typically, you also produce many of the same thing in manufacturing. So uh, the processes have time to mature uh, and get refined. In construction, uh, you have uh, a situation where uh, all the uh, fabrication resources go to the site. And the site is almost always not in a controlled environment. It's in an open space, uh, vulnerable to weather condition and all that. The work is highly manual, so you depend a lot on, on people. And uh, typically, the construction workers uh, at the lower levels uh, are not as familiar with jobs as, as manufacturing uh, workers are. Uh, Education-wise, they're typically not as high. And uh, so what happens because of all these variables, uh, the, the being in, in, out in the open at the mercy of the elements, and, and the construction workers uh, they could get sick, they could not show up or, um, or, or do a lot of um, mistakes in quality because they do one at a time and then they change the design typically unless there is a track housing or, or, or same building one after the other when they go through the learning curve. The construction management is, is really uh, uh, very difficult one. And, and therefore, and that adds to the cost and duration uh, and quality problems of construction. And I believe uh, these technologies uh, are going to uh, alleviate a lot of those problems. James, you want to chime in? Yes. I believe that this technology is going to fundamentally redefine what it means to be a general contractor and what it means to be an architect. Already what we're seeing with the emergence of automation in the field, it's become almost a click and print architecture paradigm whereby there's less manual labor involved, which has the offset additive uh, advantages, for example, of increased safety, lower insurance costs because of the liability. But beyond that, what I envision is a teleoperations presence on the construction site. Similar by analogy, for example, to Rolls-Royce and what they're doing with the oceanic automated f shipping fleets uh, with respect to their uh, uh, head, uh, headquarters, command center concepts. I believe that eventually uh, we'll have these uh, command centers at architectural firms where engineers will be working across multiple projects and in a, again, that's another solution in terms of scalability. But these engineers are working on multiple projects using teleoperations, for example, whether it be Boston Dynamics and their bipedal robots or another system similar. But in addition to that, therefore, uh, you reduce the requirement of, of, of human labor on site and the danger, but, in a, but you also increase the productivity because these systems could be running 24-7. Mostly they use LiDAR and that doesn't necessarily even need lighting. However, I'm sure that there will be uh, designs in place with respect to the process of future construction. So I envision a system where large-scale 3D printers are on-site working with in-situ resource utilization processors and then these bipedal robotic systems which are being operated at the architectural firms are then uh, coordinating the progress with on-site uh, general contractors. So I don't believe necessarily it eliminates the process of a general contractor or the definition thereby with respect to this 
current traditional paradigm, but it alters it, it evolves it in such a way that it meets the needs of the 21st century. It increases uh, the capability. Uh, one command center potentially could be running dozens of projects at a time. From a unique perspective that I have with the architectural firm, we have a construction department embedded within the firm. And it's very interesting to see even the innovative aspects of, of BIM technology being applied in front of us and to see every day these new technologies being integrated into the workflow and the process of the construction. And I think that as the new generation of architects and engineers uh, rise up to, uh, to this career, that we're going to begin to see dramatic shifts towards this telepresence slash automation. And that's going to affect everything from uh, undersea exploration to remote production to the front lines of battlefields in the future to space. I think the, the, the major game player that's going to really make a big change is the project delivery. From a designer point of view, uh, the rapid, rap, rapid manufacturing or the 3D printing the speed these parts could be produced with the accuracy, the, the level of accuracy that can be built puts now um, a, big, a big rule as an architect or designer to the, for the tools to evolve. So the, when, when the architects start to move from the mechanical pen to the CAD, that was like a breakthrough. And then when it starts from the CAD to the BIM, they thought this is like, now this is, we have the answers for all, everything. Now the, the model has the information that the contractor needs to build the building as accurate as possible as without any digress from the original design intent. But with all these technologies, there's this blurry boundaries between architecture tools and other scientific uh, tools that's been used. Like for example, differential geometry, more advanced because now uh, what was before can be built or what before was very, very costly to build now become really easy available. So. The palette for the architect that he can pick from and the arsenal that he can start to use, start to expand larger and start to put more challenges of why are you designing this, what the intent of this, is it just aesthetically driven or is it performance driven? Because the, the, with this new technologies, basically there is no limitation of what you can do potentially, um, but it's still the architecture design for the realm and the tools that they were using it has to evolve with the speed that the manufacturing or the fabrication process also evolving. So, on that note, I, I wonder how, you know, for other industries, 3D printing technology has really uh, been seen to democratize uh, productive capacity, uh, creative uh, capacity. Do you see in the, f I mean, do you see 20 years down the line or maybe you know, five years, 10 years down the line, of, of much smaller sort of um, ind individuals being able to produce their own houses themselves or design their own houses themselves? Or will the tools be made available? Uh, and how will those tools be made available? And that is to anyone. So for all what we're trying to talk about now is like full scale, full scale printing, right? But I believe there's also another realm that could be really explored. And I think people, it's, it's a component or portion of it. Like imagine a, a smart panel, like something that can really know what's the component that's gonna come next to it, what's gonna happen to it, if it's gonna water connector or electri electricity connector, right? So maybe with this mass customization, because you don't have to make a mold for each customer, uh, the customer can have potentially the ability to really fully flexibly custom parts, which can be 3D printed on demand and then delivered to whatever their house or their home and they can start to assemble this. So the, as an engineer or designer or architects, we should set the rules. So basically imagine a radio dial that you slide and move away that can shift the form or that can shift, change the parameters, but you control this when it comes to safety, zoning requirement and things like that. But the, the still the customer or the end user have the capability of customize or make generation generation of multiple iteration or permutations of the design that could really be really unique to each one or based on, because initially the main concept for Amy, I, I made an algorithm that can make about 300 different designs. They all could be 3D printed. They all could meet all the requirements of safety, structure, capability. We picked that one because it's not only the best, because just our, 
our genes, our, our, our um, phenotypes, we have different pre predilection for things. So it's very subjective. We picked that one because it's fully functional, but we decided to do that one. So I think now we'll have a little bit more control handed to the user, the end user, and that with flexibility of all these techniques together, uh, they still can, with the, everybody tries to be unique. That's why you have an app, like have 20 or 40 different app for a weather. It's the same information, it just tells you a two digit number about what's the temperature is gonna be today. But because of the preference, because of the predilection of users, each one thinks this is the best app for them. So it's a similar thing, the design evolving should have similar fashion. Uh, care to follow sure. that up? The, so the mass customization of these systems, I believe will, if not forever, but for a very long time, still represent a high barrier of entry into the field. These are some of the largest, most complex machines on the planet. And the experience necessary to not only operate and maintain it, but for the materials aspect in the material side with respect to the local uh, aggregates and granulates, it's just so demanding that I, I can only imagine that there will only be a few industry uh, competitors which can rise to the challenge with respect to scaling the process commercially. Uh, the democratization of the technology certainly, I think, in terms of just the natural uh, inherent um, uh, characteristics of the technology that once you build a machine and you can continue to maintain and operate it, it will continue producing houses and continue to produce large infrastructure over the years. So as the years go by, after 10, after 20 years with these machines, uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, projects that, that would have under, been undertaken. And overall, in a communalistic sense, the overall cost in, in uh, 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 margins with respect to uh, overhead, for the operation and maintenance of these machines will continue to drop and that will be marginalized the longer that the machines are running. However, I certainly think that there are interesting options to explore, perhaps communities that invest in these machines and then distribute the time on the machines in terms of printing. Uh, another option that we've uh, seen success in has been a leasing program and so we've done about a dozen leases at this point with different companies mostly in Europe uh, some for artificial coral reefs uh, some for uh, the facade work uh, non-structural low bearing uh, facades we, we've gotten a lot of work there sculptural works and through those leasing programs we're able to provide the talent we haven't de developed the technology to a point yet where we need a training certification program but I believe that the industry is headed towards that, where we would be offering certifications uh, in the technology for the maintenance. But right now we're doing that in-house. So every project that comes to us is unique and, and we are uh, helping with respect to our expertise with maintenance and operations, but we've created a leasing program around that. We haven't done any sales yet, but I think that's still far off for the industry. Uh, my hope is that as the industry advances over the next few years, we will begin looking at uh, retrofitting existing automobile manufacturing plants to start producing these machines. At that point, I see a lucrative market for uh, general contractors and construction companies to purchase these machines, or in a situ or, or, or a program similar to Caterpillar or John Deere, where you're using these uh, extrusion nozzles and in integrating them into these existing formats, because that also allows uh, the uh, the uh, several incentivizations for the companies to adopt the technology as well. So, uh, now, do you think the you alluded to it earlier, being uh, some barriers to entry being regulatory framework? Uh, where would you place it on, on, uh, on tiers of primary barriers to um, making this mainstream? I think that the regulatory framework is still emerging and that there's a great opportunity here now coalescing with the momentum to make a meaningful impact. Uh, for example, uh, Last year, as a result of the momentum with respect to asteroid mining companies, 
the uh, Congress finally addressed the question of space property rights. Obama, in fact, signed the legislation over Thanksgiving. And I see a similar analogy because these are both emerging fields with a lot of spin-off applications that simply is a matter of precedence. The construction industry, by its very nature, is conservative in its adoption of technology. They've used the same processes for, uh, for centuries, and that's what makes it so ripe for, dis uh, for disruption in, by new technology. Now, these regulatory frameworks, I think, if they existed, could incentivize the growth of the industry. And right now, it's more so a one project at a time approach in terms of uh, how do you approach the existing framework. I wasn't able to explain it due to the time constraints, but that earlier permit that I showed in the slide point of presentation, uh, I wanted to point out a very interesting aspect. So under building manufacturing use, it's just a small category in the permitting process. They have three, I think. It's uh, brick and mortar, there's, uh, there's the steel beams, and, uh, and then wood and frame construction. And so what we did is we added a, a fourth box underneath it and said 3D printing and checked it off. But now we're working really closely with regulators in terms of that, and we don't get to the structural load bearing projects until next year, likely. I mean, maybe this year, depending on how many printers we can get to that site after the thaw. However, this is an evolving situation, and I think that, again, the correct incentivization through, an industry, through the industry and the right momentum will open up new opportunities, which right now I think are holding back the ability to scale. However, I will bring up that uh, Wind Sun has been quite successful with respect to the fact that they've been printing multi-story buildings. Now, their process is sort of an amalgamation of 3D printing and some of the other construction-like processes where they're uh, 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 raising walls and, and attaching them in certain ways. So it's not technically true 3D printing, but parts of it is. And I think that's a great indicator in terms of the way that this technology is being integrated into the existing construction paradigm. Again, as Kasha Nevis pointed out, there, it's not um, a revolutionary uh, process by any means. More so, it, it's just another tool that architects and general contractors can use to create more efficiency and, and to fully realize the ideas of the architects. So I think we have time for one more question before we open it up to the audience. Um, and I wanted to ask you about the applications uh, within aerospace and, uh, and new space, as they're calling the new uh, commercial space industry, do you see that uh, as uh, catalyzing uh, its adoption here on Earth, or do you see uh, um, it being a you know, parallel track towards uh, implementation? And I think that applies to all three of you in terms of the projects uh, you're working on. So uh, based on my own experience working on the NASA project, uh, it has actually helped uh, our terrestrial technology to improve. Um, we have not shown most of our recent work. Uh, we've been just busy doing the work. <laughs> um, but um, when you're put in a challenging situation, uh, like having to construct using in-situ material in difficult conditions like the moon, uh, you're pushed to create, to be creative <laughs> in order to solve the, the many problems. And, and in that process, uh, you become smarter for simpler problems. And uh, so it really has helped me. I, I think it's going to impact what we do on Earth. Secondly, with respect to the future of space, um, definitely humanity is not going to be confined to this uh, rather small planet. Uh, there is a visionary uh, scientist, uh, there was a visionary scientist um, by the name of Kardashev, the Russian um, astrophysicist, uh, who maintained that uh, humanity goes through several stages of civilization. Uh, the very first stage, uh, humanity uh, capitalizes on the energy of a single planet, like we have been doing on fossil fuel on, on Earth. 
uh, that the next stage is humanity's capitalization on the energy of a star, which in our case will be the sun, and, and the territory will be the solar system. And the moon being so close, uh, it will be the first uh, place uh, to capitalize on. As you see, there's already uh, NASA and European Space Agency, the Japanese, Chinese, uh, a lot of people have got their eyes on the moon right now. And, um, but because of the resources that it offers, it's not only what is there, but also just the position of this uh, planet. Uh, that, for example, you can use it as a relay station for data, uh, uh, transmission, you can use it uh, to put servers on, internet servers on it, for example, and so on. Uh, To me, when I proposed this uh, project to NASA, I, I really couldn't think about uh, other viable methods. A lot of things that have been proposed for constructing infrastructure and habitats uh, on other planets are based on taking stuff from Earth. And given that it will take about $100,000 to get, to get a kilogram of payload to the moon, you know, it just becomes uh, unacceptable, you know, the brick will cost you a couple of hundred thousand dollars to get there. How, how are you going to, co going to construct major uh, I think hence uh, the space industries, right? Uh, that's the um, idea. So, so basically, the, to finish, uh, I, I, I didn't see anything really more viable than 3D printing using the uh, institute material which I think is pretty feasible and will be the way of building uh, planetary construction, basically. Yes, yeah, so this is a very interesting topic for me. I see, naturally, a synergy between both applications with respect to space and terrestrial. Both require automation, both require a measure of telepresence, and, and therefore those two aspects integrated to the 3D printing paradigm, I believe, will uh, coalesce quite nicely. Uh, with respect to NASA and the ESA, we're focused more so on the research and development. With terrestrial applications, it's the commercialization of that research and development, and the spin-offs, and the demonstration of value for that research, and the sunk costs with respect to the development. It's an extraordinary time right now. With the new ESA director, uh, Von Warner has suggested, not only suggested, but advocated for a new lunar settlement on the far side of the moon for f four people. Uh, this is called the Lunar Global Village. The, the far side offers significant opportunities for commercial and private industry, as well as governments, as well as in our exploration towards Mars. Additionally, on the near side of the moon, with Shackleton Crater and the resources to be harvested there, including helium-3, I think provide that incentivization for such programs. However, there's no ability to create a legacy program or sustainable lunar architecture without first addressing the issue of the regolith abrasion. And because of that, I think it's just so critical that you have the ability to print the landing pads, again, the roads, the habitats, everything in that infrastructure uh, needs to be shielded both against radiation and micrometeorites and the regolith itself because as the zenith occurs with the sun, it actually kicks up a cloud of regolith, which is about three meters uh, in certain areas. And walking through that, it will abrade uh, the spacesuits, the equipment, and over time it leads to degradation. And I think that it creates an unsustainable uh, paradigm without the fundamental inclusion of 3D printing. And I believe that this is what has been recognized by the European Space Agency. Now, uh, for multiple years, they've uh, had their animations with respect to a lander with two rovers that descend from the lander and 3D print the habitat and the infrastructure. 
Now, there's no work with respect to a large-scale rover system. However, the beauty of 3D printing is that it's customizable. So it just takes more time if it's scaled down, if the th rovers are smaller. So I believe that realistically it's within our grasp. And I believe that the ESA recognizes the importance of this technology and therefore the offshoot uh, applications, therefore terrestrially as well. And I believe that perhaps the spearheading of these programs by R&D uh, 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 interested organizations like NASA and the ESA will help further the development of these terrestrial applications. Now, I'm working with a really exciting company called Redworks, and uh, they were in the NASA Mars competition as well. I believe that they have the best approach to sustainable uh, uh, habitation on the moon and Mars. Uh, their designs utilize an excavated, uh, encircling interior that goes down multiple levels. And the top canopy is 3D printed around that. And the conjunction of 3D printing and excavation, I think, is truly relevant as well for terrestrial applications, uh, for remote islands, for bases, as well as housing. A, a unique approach in terms of utilizing the natural uh, topology of the land as real estate and real property in it of itself is entirely unique. It just creates another synergy for 3D printing to emerge within the construction industry. Buy local? Buy local and print local. Sounds good. I think we'll open it up uh, to questions now from the audience and from our uh, live stream audience. Does anyone care uh, to, does anyone have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think we should have a microphone running to you, if not. Uh, my mic? Sure. Still bootstrap. I got it. It's, I guess, a bit of a comment uh, with maybe you'll respond. Um, we were talking earlier, and I, I've always looked at 3D printing and its current stage as kind of when, you know, IBM went to Microsoft and said, could you develop a software program when Apple, according to the movies, when they were building a, a board in a garage and taking it to people who had to assemble it. So the techies only were involved in it, and eventually it evolved to the point where we all know where it is today. I think that we're going to see big jumps in, I'll call it the terrestrial version of, of 3D printing for larger scale. I don't want to say just housing, because housing involves so many other factors, including licenses and, um, and stresses, electrical, plumbing. But I think as people are starting to have their own 3D modeling kits at home, which they will then be able to send to you, I don't remember your name, the architect, and say, I want this house built. And they'll have already modeled it with the canopies and, and many elements that you can then take and translate into a house which either you will build or you will build in one of your two ways. And it'll come out of a factory. And you'll have programs that will automatically put in all the plumbing and electrical in all the places. And although they may be the same houses, they'll all have their own special treatments so that I can have an extra big window and he can have three windows and a high ceiling and a low ceiling. And that's how I see this evolving very quickly within the next 10 years. Because the large scale printing will be there, but it'll have to be in factories with the technical know-how. Can't just hand it over to a small town and say, go print your houses. You know? And but I see that's where the innovation's gonna come from people starting at their own homes, sending you the files, and saying, build me a house. Actually this is interesting because my five year old in kindergarten. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mark Bar. 
I'm with Lazar Equities in Montreal, Canada, and I'm a partner in D-Shape. Very interesting. So my, my five-year-old in kindergarten, they have five maker bots in their, in their classroom, and they're using um, an app that they can doodle, and the app automatically generates a three-dimensional lattice. They can 3D print whatever they doodle. So they're really early users of this technology. We are even more, like, I would wait a day or two for my model to be 3D printed. They can have it readily available for them. So um, I see. I see this as a tool is going to be adding to the arsenal of creativity as crayons and watercolor and pastel and all these things. But um, now it's very esoteric that you have to have the learning curve for 3D modeling and to get to the level you can make a watertight model that can automatically 3D print it. Of course, it's going to be overcome very soon and everybody will be able to 3D model something and. 3D printed and use it around the house and have what they need right away, even if it's a miniature or macro scale. Uh, so um, it's exactly what happened with digital photography and how now put more pressure on real photographers to be more even creative because every single person now has an access to a high resolution, it's the 12 or 60 megapixel camera even within their approach, right, within their reach. So. There is no problem of taking bad pictures with films and develop them. And uh, so you can see the quality of photography design should increase by developing uh, advances and things like that, or technology like this, right? Another example is the emergence of these online uh, platforms such as Thingiverse uh, through MakerBot. And they have a wealth of uh, 3D model libraries for functional components, for aesthetic components, for objects, for toys. It, it's just incredible the, uh, the amount of, uh, of creativity that has been applied to this industry. And in such a way, I think we'll only see that continue to develop more with the addition of more capabilities in terms of future desktop machines, at least. Uh, however, for, again, the large-scale 3D printer systems, the high barrier to entry, I, I still believe that's really going to uh, limit the initial, at least, uh, scalability. However, uh, existing issues such as climate change mitigation provides a likely incentive for this type of technology as well. The ability to build seawalls, the ability to print piers, the ability to reinforce structural bridge components. Uh, that's a project that we have in Mexico with an incredible engineer and designer. And the idea through that is that if you're able to conform the piers uh, or the bridge trusses to the flow of the water, then you can create an, an aerodynamic uh, uh, pier that is customized to the evolving conditions. I think. Projects like that are so fascinating, but they require a multifaceted, multidisciplinary approach because then you're dealing with putting the 3D printer on the barge, dredging the uh, the sand from below in terms of the ISRU aspect again, and so there's going to be a lot of uh, um, obstacle obstacles uh, surmountable uh, with respect to the those uh, expert, uh, individual sub-disciplines and expertise, but coming together, I think that the need to address the infrastructure issue, uh, the need to address climate change and, to, and the mitigation of flooding, I think that's going to become so compelling that just naturally the industry is going to look towards solutions, and I still have not found a better solution than large-scale 3D printing. Currently, people can design their homes, right? Even if there are 3D printers around, they're not going to be the ones running those machines and building them. Some people right now have 3D printers at home. And there is very simple software some companies sell that kids under five years old can, can actually design their stuff and build things. Uh, yeah, so you build a little plastic part, and if it is not what you want, if there's errors in there, you toss it and you build another one. How could a novice design a building that will use $20,000, $30,000 worth of material 
And if you happen to do something wrong, you have to pay five, ten, twenty thousand dollars to demolish and remove the thing. Plus, there is the issue of regulatory overseeing what's going on. Um, yes, today you can design your building, your house, whatever it is, and show it to the architect. You know, um, even. 500 years ago, people did that. They drew it on a piece of paper and showed it. Eventually, it takes you know, the expert's opinion before embarking on actual construction of such an expensive and critical structure. So I don't think that will ever happen, that uh, just people, because there is something that is automatically capable of building something very quickly, people will take the liberty of designing it themselves and just passing it to the machine to build it. No, I agree. Hello? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Works for you. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that's the point I was making, that what's happening now, even as, as James pointed out, is people are creating things and there are factories or shops that will th take the 3D uh, model on, on a, on a on a program, on an Adobe program or something, and they can ship it off to this factory, and the factory's engineers will look at it and make that piece of jewelry exactly the way they wanted it, either in plastic, titanium, or gold. And that's what I was saying, is that I see that people over the years will, will be getting their own little 3D, um, uh, what's it, I'm using the word toys, but 3D uh, makers, maker bots at home, and even the architects are now becoming much more familiar with the technology by using it in their own shops. And that, yes, somebody like me will, will design their own design, in parenthesis, their own home, at home, taking mo things from magazines and pieces here and pieces there and whatever. And then, yes, because of all the factors that you mentioned, which I agree with completely, I'll go to my architect. He'll then extrapolate that. Then it's got to go somewhere to be built. And I think that there will be large versions, maybe Winsome in a way is one of those, but there will be large versions of these companies that are building your own little models now. Except, well, we have prefab home companies already. Even the prefab home companies may um, redefine themselves to start doing 3D modeling so that you get a very unique feature in your own home. But yes, from me, the con from me sitting at home, to my architect, to my builders, I agree, that's the route it'll go, but it'll speed it up.